And we are back for the last segment of the day on the API-driven regulation uh, conference, API's New York, uh, especially in the API-driven business model track. Uh, so for this last segment, we will start uh, by, uh, by another industry that will uh, that will tell us uh, their story. It's the automotive industry. And for that, we're really glad to have uh, Ross Garrett uh, joining us on stage. Hello, Ross. How are Hi, you? It's great to be back. Yeah, great to be back live for this time, but hopefully uh, in real in real life soon. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, you're an usual speaker of APIs conference over the last few years, but now uh, you will tell us about building the world's the world largest connected vehicle platform. Uh, yes, so are you able to share slides with us? That's perfect. Your full screen. The stage is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you, Russ. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's great to, it's great to be here. I, I'm not sure how many uh, API Days events I've spoken at, but it's it's been quite a few, uh, and so I'm I'm glad to be back. Um, today, as as many said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, how we at Volkswagen are building a new connected vehicle platform. But you know, first of all, I really want us to have a think about um, the market. Uh, how can it be that you know, we have more smart, connected, intelligent, digital experiences in our kitchen uh, than we do in our in our vehicles, in our cars. Um, this uh, so-called Internet of Things, right, has made a profound impact for sure on lots of our areas of our life, um, and, and not just amongst early adopters either. Uh, in fact, I would say the early adopter wave um, was was quite some time ago. And now um, the you know smart devices, smart things uh, are, are a key part of our, our lives today. Uh, in fact, you know, as I was thinking about this talk and doing a little bit of preparation, I look back to um, a previous presentation that I've given um, here at, at API Days, the, a previous event uh, in San Francisco that was actually focused on IoT way back in 2015. Um, and at that point in time, I was really talking about um, the um, the realities of, of of connected things and where they really connected. They were, you know, we had so many of these so-called smart things, and in reality, um, they they had a mobile application, but they weren't necessarily um, connected in in the way that we think about today. Um, and so, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this uh, this image, this mobile application um, image here. Uh, is is also from 2015, um, but uh, the sad reality is it's not. This, in fact, represents the the pinnacle of connected vehicle experiences today, right? Where you can log in and maybe you know see how much gas or or, or uh, um, electricity is is in your car. The you can you know lock and unlock the doors, maybe set the air conditioning, maybe start the car. Um, but this is. This is really as connected as it gets. Um, and uh, whilst it's quite easy to, to poke fun at, at, this, uh, at this situation, um, you know, and certainly that's what I was doing uh, from the sidelines back in 2015. Now uh, I find myself inside the proverbial glass house. And, and so um, I thought instead of throwing stones, I should tell you a little bit about um, some of the things we're doing here at Volkswagen um, to make this uh, um, this world of, of truly connected vehicles um, a reality. But first, um, I thought let's let's do a little bit of context setting. Um, first of all, about Volkswagen because I think there's there's some interesting stats here, and then also a little bit about um, the market and the opportunity in front of us. So first of all, you know. People think about Volkswagen, uh, it's, it's obviously a, a very well-known global brand, but uh, did you know that uh, we're actually the parent company for many of, of the world's most loved brands? So, of course, Volkswagen VW, um, Audi, Seat and Skoda for, for folks in, uh, uh, in Europe, um, Bentley, Bugatti, Lamborghini um, for those uh, with more money than sense, I suppose, um, Porsche, Ducati, and then some uh, um, commercial vehicles as well. We're, we're focused primarily on the passenger vehicles here at Volkswagen Automotive Cloud, but certainly this represents the overall portfolio. And we are, in fact, the, the world's largest auto manufacturer, um, producing 
uh, something like 11 million vehicles per year. That little asterisk um, isn't uh, to um, get into a conversation about market cap and our friends at Tesla, but in fact, it's to, to highlight that we actually jostle for the top spot uh, with Toyota. For some reason, North America is very um, fond of the Camry. And, and so uh, we compete every year in terms of um, who is the really the, the largest manufacturer. And we're, we're within uh, you know 100,000 vehicles of each other typically. Our team, um, all of Volkswagen, something like 670,000 people globally. Um, obviously, VW headquartered in Wolfsburg, Germany, um, but we are very much a global business. And uh, our team, the Volkswagen Automotive Cloud team, um, a much smaller uh, group, uh, are based in Seattle uh, here in the US. Um, we, we started this company um, really at the, at the end of uh, 2019 and, and have hired um, almost 200 people um, throughout the COVID situation of last year. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're looking forward to uh, bringing everybody together as soon as possible. Um, we're also uh, committed to electric vehicles. Um, you've perhaps seen uh, some of the, the new EVs from Volkswagen, from Audi, from Porsche um, that, that we've announced and, and uh, put into production uh, as, as, as recently as this year. And um, we're also selling our EV platforms to other OEMs. Um, Ford um, will bring uh, a, a, an EV to market on top of our um, EV platform, most likely in Europe, um, something like the ID4, um, but uh, but a Ford vehicle. And here in North America, we actually run the fastest EV charging network. This is Electrify America, another portfolio company. Um, and so at 350 kilowatts, at the some of the, the fastest chargers we offer, um, that that is faster than any other um, provider um, of charging uh, network um, in the country today. Um, Electrify America and Electrify Canada, I should say. Um, so that's just a little bit of context about VW. Um, I also want to sort of highlight the opportunity in front of us. Um, the, the, the world of connected vehicles um, really does represent a huge opportunity um, for, for monetization. Um, there's uh, something like a $750 billion um, pot uh, to, to go attack here. And, and I think if we look at um, you know, the, the stats in terms of the number of cars that are now on the road um, that have at least some level of connectivity or the ability um, to be more integrated to our digital lives. That's how we start to capture some of that, um, some of that opportunity. But of course, you know, there's, there's a bunch of challenges as well. Um, the, perhaps one of the, the biggest challenges we have is simply around handling the, the the volume of data. It's it's an enormous amount of data that we can um, produce, consume, and analyze uh, on a daily basis. Uh, fully autonomous vehicles um, could produce up to twenty terabytes of data per day, um, and so obviously, excuse me, the, the transfer and processing of of that data. Uh, represents a huge technology challenge um, for us and for our partners. And these two things in, in combination then start to uh, demonstrate the, the future of, of what um, vehicle ownership and, and the driving experience will actually be. Um, data and connectivity are the backbone certainly of how autonomous driving works. It really is a data problem, being able to understand what, uh, you know, roads look like wet versus dry when there are leaves on them when it's foggy when it's raining um etc uh, being able to handle different types of uh of road markings traffic signs uh, traffic lights etc um so it's really a data challenge to be able to train our models in order to handle all of these different scenarios and if we look at the the capabilities or the the roadmap here of how um, the, the world of autonomous driving has been adopted, we're really at the very beginning of this journey, right? I like to think about this as um, hands off is where we are today. Um, eyes off uh, would be the next stage. Um, going toward vehicles that do not require somebody um, as a driver uh, at all. And again, this is really a connectivity and data problem um, so that we can collect the, um, the information and train the models in order to support this. So that's just a little bit of, of context setting. 
Um, to talk more specifically about what we at the Volkswagen Automotive Cloud are doing, um, I thought it useful uh, to sort of highlight some of the, the problems and challenges that are a little more specific. And um, so I'm, I'm certainly talking in the context of Volkswagen today, um, the Volkswagen Group, I should say, but much, if not all of these things um, would be true across other traditional OEMs for sure. And we're all experiencing many of the same challenges. Um, certainly for us, uh, you know, fragmentation and complexity is, is a key area because um, we have such a large number and diverse uh, set of brands, vehicles, customer segments, geographies, etc. cetera. Um, we, we know that in order to offer, um, you know, scalable and, and highly performance services in every region around the world, um, you know, we have to architect for that sort of scale from day one. And so that's one of our one of our challenges. Um, I think everybody has seen from a buyer and owner and driver perspective that, uh, um, you know, there's the, the, there's the sense of uh, you know, the in-car experience being a little underwhelming. Maybe those uh, mobile applications that allow you to unlock the car or start the car and um, feel a little underwhelming. They certainly do to me. Um, and, and I think, you know, in the world of, uh, you know, continuous innovation and continuous delivery of software, we're often stuck with the same set of features and capabilities that a car enters production with. And so being able to provide um, updates over the air, et cetera, is something we need to be able to do. And that then helps us, you know, test new ideas, um, push new software out and, and hopefully um, shorten some of the development um, cycles that, that we have with uh, software in and around the vehicle today. And so these set of problems are, really represent what, what we're trying to do here at, at VWAC. We're all about consistency and simplicity, right? We're trying to make it, uh, to, to deliver an, an API first approach to um, service development, service creation, app development and app delivery around and within the vehicle. Um, so that will um, effectively reduce the cost and, and duration of development, certainly, but it will also open up um, the, the world of, of vehicle connectivity to a whole new range of, of developers, audiences, partners, et cetera. And, and I'm, I'm going to share some of that uh, with you in, in the next couple of slides. Um, really, you know, we see our job as providing the platform that enables new digital experiences. Um, and, you know, why, why are we taking this on? Why do we think um, we Volkswagen can, can actually make a difference here? Well, you know, we are the largest manufacturer and we, we offer such a diverse set of products in so many regions uh, that, uh, you know, we, we can um, deliver market leading data insights. And as I mentioned, you know, get us to those higher levels of, of autonomous driving um, hopefully more quickly and certainly um, with, uh, with more reliability and, and global reach. And finally, you know, we see it as our job to really provide the tools and the best practices and, and uh, um, uh, experiences that will allow third party developers to create this new economy to be able to really leverage um, the, uh, um, that $750 billion market that's in front of us. Um, our platform then, and I'm not going to get into any technical detail at all, but I just wanted to give you a sense of, uh, of what we're doing. Um, and and si simply, we are, you know, creating a way to unify uh, connectivity uh, and, and data ingestion and, and, uh, and control uh, between the vehicle and, and, and applications uh, in the cloud. So, you know, we're talking to vehicles via MQTT primarily, but through a number of other uh, channels and protocols as necessary. Some large file uh, transfers, for example, and would, would use HTTP uh, most likely. Um, and then transposing all of that complexity, all of that fragmentation uh, into a set of simple unified APIs that makes it easy to deliver um, services on top. So um, in, it's, it's really an API integration platform in many ways, um, allowing us to um, simplify um, uh, the world for developers. And, and, you know, as I think about then how we're going to um, leverage that, um, you know, there's, there's a huge number of, of potential use cases here. This slide really doesn't even scratch the surface in terms of 
what's possible. In, in fact, in many cases, this represents some of the features that we already offer, but we know that um, there will be so many more um, digital experiences to come in the future. And this is really the competitive battleground now. Yes, people still care about um, you know, performance and reliability and uh, um, you know, a variety of other things and they're going out to, to buy a car. But when, when you think about how it could be uh, more deeply integrated into your digital life, I think these are, are, are areas where um, we will certainly um, you know, change buyer behavior and influence the buyer process. Um, I want to drill into one specific example uh, here, and, and it's this concept of, of extended vehicle. Uh, this, this concept, and I'm going to walk through it very quickly, is, is actually related to uh, a European regulation that's just come into effect. Uh, it's, uh, so as of September 2020, this, this notion of uh, extended vehicle, um, uh, you know, required that um, all OEMs, all auto manufacturers must provide non-discriminatory vehicle data access. And, and so uh, I'm gonna walk through the basics of the concept and then talk about a couple of the, the key use cases that, that we see as uh, you know, opportunities on the back of, of this sort of workflow. Of course, you know, we're talking about sharing data related to the vehicle and to the drivers and passengers of that vehicle. Consent uh, is really the foundation here. So um, the, the first step is ensuring that our customers are able to explicitly provide consent and that, that we can access their data, anonymize it certainly, and then share it uh, in the context of some of the use cases I'll, I'll show. Um, and so that's then done in partnership with, with the various brands. So Audi or Porsche or Skoda can, can say, you know, here are uh, the, you know, here, here's a package of data um, related to a segment of customers, for example, or a certain, um, you know, level of, of uh, data availability, or frequency of data availability that might be interesting to third parties to, to consume. And then that's where we, we come in, right? We're actually the technology platform that allows all of this to happen. So we're collecting the data from vehicles. We're transforming and, and unifying and harmonizing what that data actually looks like. And um, we're managing all of the consent within uh, within our within our platform, and uh, you know creating a uh, a master data catalog, if you like, so that um, there's a consistency across the data that we're exposing. And that's when it then goes off to um, this uh, this new player in the market, these um, data marketplaces. These are neutral third parties that are then aggregating, if you like, data, not just from, from Volkswagen uh, Group brands, but also a variety of, of other OEMs in region, uh, and then making that available uh, to, to a variety of service providers in the context of insurance, fleet management, maintenance, et cetera. And there's a whole bunch of good, uh, good reasons for us, the brands, to do this. Um, we can deliver unique value, and certainly it represents a, uh, a way to capture some of that revenue opportunity we talked about. Um, and it's, uh, it's good for customers too, right? New types of services, potentially safer roads, improved, uh, in, improved uh, you know, traffic safety, um, lower insurance premiums, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the end-to-end -end life cycle of, of what's called the extended vehicle concept. Um, there are a, a wide range of use cases here, and I couldn't, I wouldn't have time to touch on them all. In fact, I have very little time left. So I will, I will simply mention that, you know, in the context of, of uh, a smart city, it might be useful to collect um, the data from, from these um, data aggregators that represents the number of vehicles passing through a particular area so that we can plan for um, road upgrades, widening, et cetera. It might be possible to, um, use uh, traffic data to determine when um, you know the street lights need to be turned on, or how to adjust the the traffic light sequences based on um, traffic flow at peak times, um, or or you know who knows there are so many possibilities here, uh, it, and simply providing access to data is really key. Um, another example uh, might be predictive maintenance. Uh, this this actually is a, a real life example from Skoda that is um, using 
a, a, a phone to record your vehicle in order to understand um, maintenance that might be required. Um, but in general, and being able to access data from the vehicle directly uh, and, and make it then possible for others to perhaps recommend, schedule um, your uh, maintenance um, ahead of time before something catastrophic happens um, is, uh, is super interesting. And, and then uh, finally, um, this, this world of car sharing, we know that car ownership is on a downward trend, something that changed slightly through 2020 um, for, for many obvious reasons. But uh, over time, we expect that um, people will be less and less interested in the traditional car ownership experience. So could you share your car with your friends and your neighbors and your family more easily? Uh, again, being able to, to uh, automate this process, right? So the, the car knows I'm usually stationary, you know, through these hours of the day. In fact, um, most cars sit parked 95% of their, of their lives. And by parked, I don't mean stuck in traffic. I mean actually parked. And and so uh, being able to uh, get more utility from from these vehicles is is very interesting to people um, that are, are buying new cars, perhaps and providing um, a safe, simple, reliable way to share access to your vehicle um, could uh, again open up um, revenue opportunities both for um, owners as well as uh, third parties and and uh, manufacturers like ourselves. So that's a quick whistle stop tour of some of the things we're doing here at, uh, at VWAC. Um, we are really at the very beginnings of this journey. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we're, we're eager to hear, um, what do you think? Like, are, are there particular services, capabilities, applications that would really move the needle as you think about your next car purchase? Um, are there capabilities from the vehicle as an app developer that you think could be turned into a useful app or service? Um, we're eager to engage uh, with customers, with the market, in order to, to make the right decisions and build out the, the, um, the, the right um, capabilities as we um, ultimately build the world's largest uh, connected vehicle platform. That's it for me. I will take questions, certainly, but thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank you very much, Russ. Uh, we have uh, three minutes uh, for uh, for question. Uh, what does that mean? Open APIs for a car. How APIs should be open for uh, uh, 100 miles per hour two ton smartphone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So op open. I, I think you know the. I think about this in the context of. Uh, you know, an, an open ecosystem in, in the sense that it's not a walled garden or, or restricted just to uh, the, the manufacturer. And we've actually gone through this same sort of model in other industries, right? Telco certainly um, was very much a walled garden. Verizon used to be able to tell you exactly what you were allowed to do on your phone, with your phone, even the bits and pieces that were inside the phone. Um, and so we're kind of in that world, right, with automotive today. A little more openness uh, will allow us to innovate more quickly and, and, and deliver value to customers. And we've been seeing the same thing in the world of, of banking and the world of healthcare too. So that's really what I mean by, by open. I certainly don't mean uncontrolled. And, and, and so what we, what we do want is uh, a way to provide you know, safe, secure, um, you know, pr uh, private controls uh, that, um, yeah, that customers will trust. Uh, so we have a uh, question from uh, LinkedIn. Uh, mm. Do you think one day we will be able to transfer our data from a car provider to another car provider? I, I think there's there's potential for that in the future. Certainly in the context of this extended vehicle concept, the, there's a little bit of that happening, right? We're sort of aggregating data from lots of vehicles together. Um, I, I think if, if, if we're talking in the context of uh, your identity and uh, then Yes, perhaps within within the Volkswagen Group, we're looking at ways to um, create seamless identity experiences across brands. Because you know, you might own a Porsche, and your daughter owns uh, an Audi, and and so you want to be able to uh, swap cars every now and then, and um, yeah, share identities across them. I think that's a perfectly reasonable use case. Um, we're we're not quite there, but I I certainly see a world where that's possible. Um, I, I also think that uh, you know being able to 
um, get access to the data, you know, your data about your driving style, perhaps about your maintenance records on the vehicle, uh, and, and being able to, you know, bring that with you uh, as you go from one vehicle and, and one brand to the next, that, that might be uh, um, hugely valuable. So, yeah, I, I certainly see potential for that in the future. Yep, thank you, Russ. We reached our 25 minutes uh, together. Uh, and again, glad to have you back at the PIDA's conferences. And I hope next year to be in a, in a, uh, in real life, not thanks. only online and remotely, but it was great to see you again. Yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to being back in person too.